WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore positive. We are positively almost out of the crab cake season, but almost into the football season. Happy Labor Day and uh, happy last week of summer. And go get your peaches and your peach cake. We're doing the Maryland Crab Cake Tour, presented by the Maryland Lottery, in conjunction with Goodwill, Window Nation, our friends at the Restaurant Association of Maryland, reminding you, Restaurant Week, right around the corner, right after the uh, Ravens are either 1-0 or 0-1. And I saw Joe Flacco throwing terrible picks in preseason games this week. Luke Jones has been monitoring all things fake football. Lucky you. Uh, the Washington Commanders and their um, third string and fourth string came into town the other night. Luke spent some time down there while I was spending some time with uh, Rod Stewart and Robin Zander and the charisma and the magnetism of Rick Nielsen and Cheap Trick. What's going on, dude? Happy uh, I can sort of kick off, right? Like, we're there now, right? Like, this is Ronnie Stanley, and they're bringing out all the guns, and here we go, and we're, we're, we got a real football game in a week and a half, and uh, are they ready? Are they ready to play football, Luke? I, I think that's the, the big question right now. I, I think in the big picture sense, there's optimism, uh, as there has been throughout the offseason, and we've talked about that, but you still have those big questions. I mean, you just mentioned Ronnie Stanley. Yes, he's off the PUP list. Is he going to be ready for week one, however? Is he going to be ready for week two? Whenever he does hit the field and playing in a game, does he look like Ronnie Stanley? Or does it look like week one Ronnie Stanley last season, which we know how that went and what happened in the weeks to follow. So there are still plenty of questions. And so much of this stems from the fact that we didn't see these guys during the preseason schedule. And that's not a criticism, by the way. From the moment we saw J.K. Dobbins tear his ACL in, in, down in Landover in, in the preseason finale a year ago, I think many of us anticipated we wouldn't see Lamar Jackson and we wouldn't see most of the starters. I think it was a total of what, four or five projected starters that saw any preseason action over these three fake football games. So that's fine. I'm, I'm totally supportive of doing things that way from a football standpoint. Now we can get into, you know, what that means for fans and people that are you know, warned, you know, that are subjected to, to spending money on these preseason games. But, I'm fine with that strategy, but it does very much lead to a, all right, what is this going to look like week one? And I, I think there is a very real curiosity at the very least, even internally, as far as what this team's going to look like early in the season, knowing that Ronnie Stanley's coming back from a major injury and has played one football game basically over the last, what, 22 months, uh, knowing that J.K. Dobbins is coming off of a big time injury, knowing that that Marcus Peters coming back from an ACL injury. And it's not even getting into some of the depth concerns that you have at outside linebacker, knowing Tyus Bowser's out till week five now on the PUP list, knowing Gus Edwards is going to be out until, I don't know, maybe mid season coming back from the, the, the ACL injury that he suffered. So it's not to be gloom and doom about it. That's not to say they're not going to win a, a lot of football games, even early in the season. But I think there is some question even among coaches, even among the front office, as far as what does this team look like out of the gate because of how they approached training camp, how they approached the preseason uh, in terms of, all right, you ramped up, you, you tried to protect these guys and, and minimize injuries, which you know, we can debate how much of that worked or not. They still have plenty of guys that are dealing with some nagging injuries right now. It's football. Well, I'm going to say that to you. We have these like, Issues we've been talking about for yeah. nine months. But how about the issues we've been talking about the last two or three weeks where they've had injuries? They had a defensive lineman go down late in yeah. week two. They, they've they got a center issue with their first pick. They have a safety issue with Kyle Hamilton not being good enough, right? You know, like they, they, they have some issues here with draft picks and with dings before they even – get to New York. I mean, hey, New York's losing Lyman, doesn't have their starting quarterback, so everybody's going through this week after week. I mean, Tom Brady even, you know, people are going through some ish, even when they're 45, right? So, uh... <laughs> Yeah, no question, and, and that's where you look at this thing, and we've debated this for years, right? I mean, how much is too much in the preseason? Is there a drawback, however, in the same way that we talked about the Ravens a couple years ago when they, they were clinching the number one seed and they rested their guys in week 17 and, you know, were they rusty then for that playoff loss to Tennessee where I think so much of that becomes a self-fulfilling thing. But the reality is whether you're talking about fake games, real games, practice, OTAs, training camp, postseason, 
injuries are going to occur, uh, occur, right? I mean, the Ravens have dealt with some of that. And you know, some of the injuries they're dealing with right now that are of the, the fresher variety are typical camp stuff, right? But it doesn't make some of those questions any easier to answer. I mean, look at outside linebacker just for one quick example. We know Tyus Bowser is, a, is on reserve PUP now. That means he's out at least until week five. You feel really good about Adafi Owe, right? You feel good about what Justin Houston's going to be, even if it's more of a situational rusher. But what else does what else are, are they dealing with at, at outside linebacker right now? Dalen Hayes banged up, completely unproven. Stephen Means, you know, kind of a nice story as a guy that had a cup of coffee with the Ravens seven eight years ago. He's he's played in the league a long time, but you know, he's kind of just been a guy, right? He's more of a journeyman. After that. What else are they going to have at outside linebacker? I assume we're going to see an outside addition of some type, you know, whether it's a name that we all know or whether it's just a guy that's bounced around and can play a little bit. But that's what we're looking at. It We've talked about it throughout the offseason, but it, it really you know, comes into the spotlight now as we're approaching week one that, you know, I've said all along with this roster, with the cap, with the realities of just trying to build a, a championship caliber team year after year, you always have years where you have your strengths and you have some other positions that don't look so good, right? I mean, that, that's just the reality. That's the nature of the beast. You're not going to have a perfect roster, even if you're among the best teams in the league. But yeah, it wait does... till they have a $52 million quarterback. They, they... Well, sure. <laughs> no question. No question. But but I do think looking at the roster this year, and, and look, there's going to be a lot of roster gymnastics that occur over the next few days. There are going to be guys that go to IR. There are going to be vet- vested veterans that are cut and then re-signed. It's going to be a lot of that. So, you know, I, I have my roster projection up at baltimorepositive.com, you know, uh, as we approach Tuesday's final cut, but there's going to be a lot of movement and there are going to be some names added to that mix that no one's talking about right now. And, you know, there could be a surprise or two. Who knows? I, I think you're going to see a couple veteran cuts that are going to look really surprising at first blush, only for those individuals to be brought back a day or two later, because that's just how this works with, you know, IR, what doesn't need it to return, all that. But going back to what I was saying, there are certain positions on this roster that are very deep right now. We've talked about safety, right? I mean, my goodness, you already had Chuck Clark. Uh, you already had Brandon Stevens. You already had Geno Stone. And you signed Marcus Williams to a big time free agent deal. And then Kyle Hamilton becomes your first first round pick. So you're very deep at a position like safety. But then you look at a position like outside linebacker right now or wide receiver, you know, because we'd <laughs> be remiss if we didn't mention that. And you look at those positions and you just say, boy, there's not a lot of depth there. Uh, I mean, especially outside linebacker right now. So it, it feels a little more extreme in that way than usual uh, as far as some positions that are really, really deep and some positions that, quite frankly, I'm very concerned about from a depth standpoint. So, again, you don't kick off till September 11th. Uh, there's plenty of roster movement that will occur uh, between now and then. There'll be roster movement that occurs between now and the trade deadline as we're getting you know, uh, closer to the middle of the season. So that's not to be alarmist about it, not to be pessimistic about it. It's just where they are right now. So uh, this is always a fascinating time of year uh, in that regard. But with having so many of those veterans not even stepped on the field during the preseason, there, there is a little more unknown. I, uh, you know, I have some unknown, you know, just to, you know, not to make it all about Lamar Jackson, but we know Lamar added some muscle uh, this, you know, this off season, which I'm fine with, but what does that look like with him in terms of his speed? Not that I think well, he's going to be slow or anything like that, that uh, but that's way, a question. Yeah. Luke Jones is here uh, at Baltimore. Luke, I, I would, that's where I was going to get at this is yeah. say the things we haven't seen, um, you know, I'm not even going to give them the benefit of the doubt on Ronnie Stanley or on Gus Edwards or guys that aren't on the field. I'm willing to give Marcus Peters the benefit of the doubt because he's been out there running around. Right. Mm-hmm. So like guys that you have, have been privy to at practice on the backfields, seeing guys run around, seeing them in full motion, even first team, even with maybe light pads on or scub, whatever they're doing right out there. There's no way to project that into 60 plays of offense, 60 plays of defense on week one, situationally and knowing where they are, other than thinking, well, we got good football players and we banged around and scrimmaged a little bit. They played no real football. And I don't know whether that's good or bad. I mean, for 50 years, we've sat over these preseason games and, uh, you know, said that they're trash. But there have been times in the old days where, 
the third preseason game for a half, you would go out there and see teams bang it out and grind it for better or worse. You'd see awful injuries, sure. the Michael Vick thing, whatever would happen. But you would have some expectation. And I don't just mean from a gambling perspective or should I bet on this or who's the three and a half point favorite or any of that, because I don't that's even crazier in week one to me when you have no basis for any of this stuff. But just trying to go out there and gauge it from their perspective, from the coaching, you've seen the offensive lines. You've seen all the machinations of who's going to be left guard, who's going to play right guard, who they're sort of spying and playing around with in the first week of preseason or whatever. But seeing the actual units together, how much of that do you feel like you've even seen on the backfields? And this time of year, you see more practice than you're ever going to see moving forward, right? Like they're about to throw you out of practice and give you 10 minutes and play games with you because that's who John Harbaugh is. But over the last four weeks, you've been out there for three hours with fans, right? Seeing them try to run first and second team. What what does it what can you discern from watching them practice? Well, and to, to, to actually fire back to what you just said, they threw us out about a week ago. So, you know, it's been since, you know, uh, August 22nd that they or August 23rd that they went into regular season mode. So uh, that's where it, it does become a little trickier to, to, to look at that. I mean, the offensive line, uh, you know, I've kind of go position by position. We know what Lamar Jackson looks like. I, I, I mentioned what is it going to look like when the bullets are live? Is he? You know, still just as explosive as he was, you know, with you know, acknowledging he added a little bit of muscle, which I don't think was a bad idea. But what does that look like? We haven't really seen him because we know he's not going to be hit uh, in, in the preseason uh, as far as practices go. So, you know, there's a curiosity there, but I wouldn't say that that's a concern. Uh, but you look at the offensive line. Is Ronnie Stanley going to be ready for week one? I, I think it's a lot to ask a guy that's going to have single digit practices to be ready for week one. When I'll also provide the context that I know he gave an interview with The Athletic uh, about midway through last season. You know, this was post injury or, or post uh, latest surgery, post going to IR, post being out for the year. And he came back on August the 8th, I believe it was, last summer. So you consider he's about three weeks behind that timetable. And he said last summer he felt he may have pushed it a little bit too quickly to be ready for the opener. Now, let me make one assumption here that you're hoping and you're optimistic and they're saying, even if there's still unknown that's going to be there until he's really out there doing football things, you know, he's in good shape. I've seen him out there watching he's practice. He's been on the football field but, for 50 weeks now, right? Like literally a year uh, he hasn't yeah, football. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's been since September 13th, What right, was the opener in Vegas, September 13th of last year. So it's been nearly a calendar year. So – you know, is he going to have enough time to be ready for week one or is that more of a week two, week three kind of thing? I mean, he said he kind of felt like maybe he rushed himself a little bit last year. Well, he's hitting the practice field three weeks later this summer, you know, going into week one. So so you have that right off the bat. You know, the rest of the offensive line, it looks like Ben Powers is going to be the left guard. It was very, you know, one of the few significant takeaways you could take from that game we saw on Saturday night other than Poe uh, getting injured which went viral and was just crazy because uh, it, it's the mascot but it, it was Tyler Linderbaum getting back on the field playing three series I thought he moved well I, I thought he looked good you know uh, so that was good to see and I think in the case of you know, your starting center I think it was important as a rookie for him to get some live reps I, I thought that was positive well, even if it was only we nine plays say here a week and a half out is we feel like he's going to be under center first snap yeah against the Jets, we're, we're pretty confident of that, as we're not confident about a lot of parts of this, right? I mean, he's yeah, the yeah. one part that sort of fell back into place here during preseason that we were like scratching our head two weeks ago saying, this guy's been injured before, same injury, out again, not practicing in August, no bueno for a first-round pick. Yeah, and, and especially you hear the you hear the word Liz Frank being thrown out there. Not, not that it was a – Clearly wasn't an extreme one like we think of Jimmy Smith years ago, but it's certainly something you want to keep an eye on. You know, but it was good. He practiced all last week. I wasn't sure we'd see him in the game, and he played. And I thought he moved well, so that was good to see. Right side of the offensive line, Zeitler at right guard, Morgan Moses right tackle. So it still comes back to Ronnie Stanley, right? I mean, if, if you have a, a version of Ronnie Stanley that is at least close to the pre-injury form, I think you're looking at a, a, an offensive line that could be a top 10, top 12 kind of offensive line. If you don't have a, a version of Ronnie Stanley that's right, and you're talking about Jawan James or Patrick McCarry at left tackle, I think you're looking at an offensive line that 
is kind of average at best. You Patrick know, uh, we, McCarry and left tackle. I mean, huh? wow. I, mean I, 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 I think it would be Juwan James. You know, I, I think McCarry would be more of your backup in that scenario. Well, McCarry Stanley would be snapping is if Lindemann won ready, right? Lindemann, yeah, right, right, yeah. I mean, that's. I'm that, just that's trying to get you... the depth chart straight in my sure. mind too, because I'm trying sure. to figure out the numbers. You know. Sure, no question about it. So you know, the offensive line, it, it comes back to Ronnie Stanley. You know, the the other unknowns. You know, Marcus Peters has been practicing a couple weeks. You know, Chuck Clark revealed to us last week, as I mentioned, we were only uh, watching the very beginning of practice last week, but he did reveal because I asked him flat out, you know, how how big is it for Marcus Peters to be back? We talked about this all last year, you know, not just his play, but the emotional, you know, the, he, he's that alpha dog, right? You know, that, 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 you know, you need a couple guys like that on your defense. So, you know, he, and he mentioned he had an interception his first day back doing team drills. So good to see. But we also know an ACL for really the, the two positions for me that really stand out are the two positions we're talking about here, running backs and cornerbacks. So much lateral movement, so much change of direction. Healthy enough to play? Yes, I, I feel pretty good about the fact that I think Marcus Peters is going to be out there week one. Is he going to look like Marcus Peters right away? That's the big question, and that's the unknown. So far, so good with everything we've gotten we've gotten to see. But again, it's more individual work, more you know, positional group work. So, you know, what does that look like? You know, J.K. Dobbins, I throw into the same conversation there. Uh, you know, he's been practicing and ramping it up for a while, but is he going to look like J.K. Dobbins right away? You know, we we all remember Jamal Lewis coming back in 02, right? Jamal Lewis had a good season in 02, but he was not anywhere close to what we saw Jamal Lewis in 03, right? It took an extra year for him to really be, wow, that, that ACL is a thing of the past because he's a 2,000-yard rusher. It took an extra year for that to happen. So doesn't mean that that's going to be the case with J.K. Dobbins. Doesn't mean that he can't have a really good productive season, but the breakout Pro Bowl version of J.K. Dobbins that everyone was imagining before he tore up his – you know, tore up his knee uh, against uh, the commanders last year, football team, whatever we were calling them then, you know, expecting that, especially right out of the gate, that's ambitious. So I think you're going to see, you know, I, th I think there's optimism that Dobbins will be out there week one, week two, somewhere like that, but probably a little more of a committee, probably a little more Mike Davis, a little more Justice Hill, maybe a little Tyler Beatty mix into the mix there. We'll just have to see how it plays out. But that's what the big questions are in terms of these guys coming back from the major injuries. You know, Marlon Humphrey had a, pe a pectoral tear. He's fine. He's been fine since the spring. Lamar Jackson had an ankle bruise. He's been fine since February. You know, I mean, th those are the injuries you're not worried about. But these ACLs, and in the case of Bowser, whenever he gets back, whenever we see David Ajabo later in the season, those are Achilles tears. I mean, th these are the injuries that you do question a little more as far as explosiveness and, you know, that there aren't going to be a little more, you know, a little more uh, of a lingering effect. So it's just where we are right now. And that, that was always going to be the case. You know, at, at any point in the offseason, when we were talking about this in January, when we were talking about this at free agency in the draft, when we were talking about this at OTAs, guys coming back from major injuries, there's always that question of, one, are you healthy enough to be back on the field? I, I think for the most part, you know, the guys that I just mentioned, other than Bowser, which we already know he's on PUP, and same with Gus Edwards, they're going to be back, whether it's week one or maybe Ronnie Stanley's week two, week three, you know, something like that. We'll just have to see. Uh, but healthy enough to play, healthy enough to thrive and be the guy you were before the injury, those are two different things. So right now, it's a lot of unknown. Coaches say, oh, guys are on schedule. Guys are looking good because that's what they always say. And that's not exclusive to the Ravens everyone's on schedule until they're not anymore. I mean, that, that's just how this works. So, you know, there, there is some unknown in that way. But in the meantime, you have a healthy Lamar Jackson. You have Mark Andrews. You, you have a right side of the offensive line that I'm feeling really good about. Uh, you have Isaiah Likely, who has been, you know, one of the stars of summer, and I'm really intrigued to see what he looks like. How about uh, them holding him out of that game the other day, right? That's was like, telling, hey, you right? made the team, right? Yeah. Who would have figured? I mean, you're talking about a not just a fourth round pick, but remember they had six fourth round picks, and he was on the back end of that even. And he's the one guy that was held out. I mean, we didn't see Hamilton Saturday night, but he was a little bit banged up. Nothing major, but he 
they held him out because uh, he, he was dealing with a physical issue. You know, the, some of the other draft picks, Demarion Williams, Jalen Armour Davis, they were held out because of injury. You know, minor injuries, but but injuries. He was the one guy of all their draft picks where they just said, yeah, kid, we, we saw everything we needed to see the first two games. You know, take the night off. I mean, that it's kind of crazy when you think about it, but it does speak to the excitement for him. Now, he's a rookie. I think it's important to understand he's a rookie. And, oh, yeah, he's still – tight end number two on this roster. I mean, Mark yeah, Andrews is wonder when's he yeah. getting the ball and when's he getting well, the I mean, field and what do the packages look like with him and Andrews on the field at the same time where he yeah. gets the ball, where he becomes sure, the target. Sure. sure. I mean, I think there's plenty, I think there's absolutely a path for him to be on the field a good bit, but you know, that, that, that means you're going to be in 12 personnel a lot, right? I mean, cause you're not going to take Mark Andrews off the field very often other than, yeah, you know, when he needs a blow here or there. So there is that. Well, they want to be heavy in general with Lamar, sure. right? They, they, you know, I don't know what kind of blocker likely is. That's for you to tell me. You've been out there yeah. watching run around, but. Uh, I mean, that that's where he needs work. Uh, there's potential there. And in the same way that Mark Andrews was not regarded as a blocker at all, and he made himself into a pretty decent, pretty solid blocker at this point in his career, even though he doesn't have to do it a whole lot. Uh, so there's that question, but. I think there's a potential for this team, especially because we know they don't have a ton of depth at wide receiver. You know, you have Bateman. You know, they brought in Demarcus Robinson from the, you know, he was with the the, the Raiders in the preseason, but a you know, longtime Kansas City Chief who's you know, been a bit guy for them. You know, a number three, number four kind of option at best for them. Uh, and a Willie Sneed. Type. Can he help them? Sure. Do I think he <laughs> does he? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, some people have made the comparison. If you think back to Seth Roberts a few years back, you know, a guy like that, but maybe a guy that you hope when he's called on to make a play actually makes them unlike Seth Roberts, who didn't make plays. And we remember his drop against the Titans uh, in that playoff loss. So it certainly doesn't quell my concerns. Let's be very clear about this. Do I think he can help, though? Is, is he someone that gives them a little more experience and a little more depth there? Sure, because well, James Prochet has been banged up. Devin DuVernay. You know, hasn't really established himself as a receiver. By the way, so, they, they really have uh, high hopes for him, right? Like, it feels like he was pushed along, pushed along. They got rid of Hollywood. And now here we are. And what's Devin DuVernay going to be as a threat on the field? Like, is he really going to be a guy that gets six, eight balls a week? No, I, I think no chance. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd be lying if I said I was incredibly high on DuVernay. I mean, DuVernay's a – look, he's a Pro Bowl return specialist. I mean, he he earned that last year. But is he going to be more in my mind than what we've seen him be, which is you know, he's made some plays here and there. You know, he's a guy that certainly you can do some jet sweep things and some other gadget plays with. Yeah, like I'm not saying he's going to be a, a total non-factor. Do I envision him taking this major leap? Well, no. I mean, I think it. you look at that hierarchy. They're clearly expecting big things from Rashad Bateman. And at this point, you know, you're still expecting Mark Andrews to be a monster season, right? I mean, that, that that's you, you've just come to expect that. And for me, the big question now is who emerges as that third option? I think Isaiah likely has as good of a chance as Prochet or Bateman or, or not Bateman, DuVernay or Demarcus Robinson. I think that's the big question right now. Who is going to be that number three option? Andrews is the number one, right? I mean, he's truly the number one receiver for this team in the same way that Todd Heap was, you know, <laughs> 20, you know, going 20, you know, going on 20 years ago. Uh, but, you know, I, you have Andrews, you have Rashad Bateman. I think the Ravens feel good, as good as they can feel about that one two punch, knowing that Bateman still has a little bit of a, you know, certainly a question mark, you know, as far as becoming the top wide receiver. But the big question is that that third option. Isaiah Likely in the summer looked like he's got a chance that he could be that guy for them. Not going to write off Proche. I mean, but he was dealing with a hamstring over the last couple of weeks, and that's limited his practice time. And, you know, Demarcus Robinson does give them a little bit of an, an outside element that they were lacking at the position. So do I feel it's a complete wide receiver group? No, uh, you know, because you're a, a Rashad Bateman injury away from saying, oh, my goodness. I mean, this is really their wide receiver group. But I, I think there's, you know, I, I think they're excited about what they have at the top of the depth chart. Uh, and I think there is a lot of optimism with Bateman. So, you know, we'll see. Uh, it's I, I, I'm not going to be at all shocked if in a month or two months or talking about, you know, kind of right in the eulogy of the season, if they fall short in January, that you know, I won't be at all shocked if we're talking about wide receiver again being a deficiency. But, you know, that's something we've been talking about at, at various times for years, going all the way back to the Joe Flacco era. So 
Uh, it, it's just where they are right now at that position. But, you know, the offense, you know, it, it begins and ends with Lamar. I mean, the, I, I'm not, you know, not exactly going out on a limb saying that, talking about an MVP quarterback. Uh, so, you know, you, you look at that. And then on the defensive side, outside linebackers, my colossal question mark right now. I feel really good about Owe, but beyond that, Justin Houston, I feel good about him as a situational guy, but right now it's looking like he's going to have to play a lot of snaps. What's that going to look like come November and December? So, well, that's also a position where you're not sneaking safeties in either. I mean, you could say, well, they're going to be light on the back. They'll play 60 Bs at various points yeah. based on their depth and, and thinking that Peters and, and Humphrey are healthy and what where they've drafted at safety, that they could be more multiple on the back end. But they already have trouble getting after the quarterback. Calais Campbell's not getting after the quarterback. You know, Brandon Williams isn't coming back in the door from 10 years ago. Like, I, I, I'm, I have questions all along as to who's going to get after the quarterback and who's going to chase Joe Burrow around when it comes time. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. And, and I, I mean, I feel good about the defensive line from a run stopping standpoint. And I actually was very encouraged by what we saw from Travis Jones in the preseason and throughout training camp as a guy that thinking, hey, he, I think he's got a chance to push the pocket. But unfortunately, you know, he hurts his knee in the Arizona game. He's going to miss a little time here. I, I don't expect to see him week one. You know, might not be ready week two. Uh, you know, might be talking about later in September. To, to well, that's finally... a hit to them because they were sure on him. Yeah, sure, sure. But but the, and you know, that's uh, we're talking about a few weeks kind of injury. But it's, it's 50 not... or 60 snaps against the Jets that he would have had, right? Well, not that high. Uh, I mean, you know, okay. yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, their rotation. You know, I mean, e- even their starters don't play that many snaps usually. So. Uh, but there's that question. And, you know, for me, we talk about getting after the quarterback, but keep in mind what Tyus Bowser does at the Sam linebacker position. It's not just getting after the quarterback. It's setting the edge, it's dropping into pass coverage, blitzing. I mean, he does so many things for them. And, you know, that transition that we saw last year from Matt Judon, who, you know, gets all the money uh, going to New England, to Bowser, you know, of all the question marks they may have had, you know, I, I thought Bowser had a really nice season last year after a little bit of a slow start and a little bit of an adjustment to becoming a starter. So who the heck there's who the heck is our Sam linebacker going to be? Because I think Owe can do those things, but if he's having to do more of those things, then he's not rushing the passer every snap. So if you don't have him rushing the passer every snap, who else are you depending on other than Justin Houston? So I think right now, as you and I are having this conversation and as listeners are pondering outside linebacker, I would not at all be shocked to see one, if not two additions uh, at that position between now and, I don't know, say the say week two, week three, you know, somewhere in that neighborhood. Man, this is every year, right? Whether it's Josh Bynes or whether they're going to the Steelers and getting special yeah, teamers. And, well, I mean, the, the, the linebacker thing is a place where they've gone in a little naked. It's not sure. unusual on September 1st that they're like, our, our linebacker for week four is playing somewhere else right now or – yeah, I mean, that's kind of been – and some of that's been philosophical. I mean, let's face it. They haven't you know, put a ton of money into either inside or outside linebacker. I mean, they put draft capital into inside linebacker a couple of years ago. And, you know, we're still wondering how good Patrick Queen is. We're still wondering if Malik Harrison's going to get on the field. You now, which, by the way, keep an eye on him as a Sam linebacker option because he's practiced at that position going back to last year. I'm not saying he's going to be the answer but I could see him being part of that rotation because again, you just look at it, you know, I, I mean, fans are, are, are hoping to see Dalen Hayes in his second year, take a step forward. I haven't, I'm waiting for it in practice and he's been banged up again and he missed the third preseason game, which would have been very valuable for a guy like him to get out there. So it, it's tough right now. I mean, outside linebacker is alarming uh, in terms of the lack of depth right now. Uh, I mean, that's why. Well, and that's something an offensive coordinator could attack with a tight end and with a running back out of the sure. backfield, right? Like, sure, that, that, sure. That's an area where you're like, well, we're just going to hit you and hit you and hit you until a Belichick would figure that out and get after you. Yeah, sure. And he might um, in week three. If uh, he might. He, he might. And, and, and again, for me, it's not just getting after the quarterback. Are you setting the edge? I mean, it, it, it's wild right now. And, you know, not to not to put too much of a somber tone on this, but I, I mean, you think with Jalen Ferguson, I mean, he would have been he would have been playing a lot based on how this is constructed right now, uh, and you know, not making light of any of that. I mean, it's uh, absolutely tragic, but you know, to look at where this position group is right now, it just speaks to uh, a guy that 
hadn't really established himself his first few years would be playing. I mean, if Dalen Hayes is healthy and they don't make any kind of notable acquisitions between now and the opener, he's going to have to be out there by default, at least a little bit. Uh, I mean, based on where it's, where it is right now. So that's concerning to me. I mean, I don't want to just hand over (laughs) meaningful snaps to a fifth round pick who hasn't done anything to prove himself at this point, even in practice, really. So uh, again, that's, that's a big question mark right now. And long-term Bowser will be back a job. They're hopeful second half of the season. He can be a factor for them. That doesn't mean he's going to be peak David Ajabo, the guy that would have been a first round pick before he hurt his Achilles. That's probably going to be more next year, but they'll, they'll look better as the year goes on, but boy, you got to get there in the meantime and you don't want to be losing games because you can't set the edge and, uh, and you're light and you can't get after the quarterback. So the secondary will help out with the pass rush element. We've talked about that coverage before pressure, but they're still setting the edge. There's still uh, a need to, have linebackers you can drop into coverage and not have tight ends and running backs kill you uh, out of the backfield uh, as receivers. So there, there's a there's a question mark with, with that. I mean, you have to. So doesn't mean that doesn't mean that thinks I think that's going to cost them football games, but it could. So very much. Well, the Eric biggest story next week will be Lamar and his contract as they go play the Jets, right? So all of this in the dirt and outside the real football stuff, like who's going to carry the ball that will all get silenced next week. Once the lines are set and Lamar is going to play without a contract or threaten to hold out week one, which I still think is, um, and by the way, first question for you at the press conference, first time you get to Lamar, first question has to be, do you have insurance? Do you have Lloyd's? No, seriously, because if he's playing with that, he should have to answer oh, that question. He is getting $23 million this year. Uh, I mean, you know, if he were making 1.5, yeah, but I mean, he has 23, $23 million in his pocket. 23 is not 150. But it's not if you 1. Point, up. But it's not 1.5 either. I mean, I mean, let's not act like $23 million isn't generational money for somebody. In in the real world sense, you know? So, I don't think in the Lamar sense it is because he wants more than that, right? <laughs> well, yeah. He's well, every worth player more wants than more. That. I don't, I don't, he's worth more he's than wor- that. Yeah. Sure, he is. Yeah, just well, just like Joe Burrow is worth more than he's making right now. Just like Justin Herbert's worth more than he's making right now. So, you know, I mean, it it is what it is. In on that front, it feels like he's going to be playing on the final year of his rookie deal, uh, a la Joe Flacco. To you know, another generation ago, uh, it feels like at this point, uh, and the Ravens feel like, hey, you know, if we're going to do this and. Lamar's not going to take what our offer is, and that's fine. We'll we'll go this we'll go uh, about it the the year to year franchise tag route. So you know, well, that we'll, plays into their hands, right? I mean, it does, but at the same time, this is where I like you know, I, and I don't. We've had this conversation twenty five times over the last year and a half, but you know, at, at some point in time, you, you look at this thing, and you know, if I'm the Ravens, you know, how do you win this? You know, like what what. How do, how do the Ravens, quote, win this negotiation? And, and that's where I keep coming back to, what, is it him having a bad year? Well, then you're worried about it from a big picture football sense. Is it him having a major injury? Well, then you're worried about it from a big picture football sense. So well, then he better to, have insurance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I mean. Uh, I mean, I don't know how he could play without insurance, right? I mean, like, literally, that's the first thing every grown-up I talk to. If he were my son, if he were you, if he were somebody I loved and cared about, yeah. I'd say, dude, they're billionaires. Guy in Cleveland is, is a criminal and got two hundred thirty-one million dollars. You shouldn't take the field until you get paid, and mm-hmm. and a, especially after having the kind of injury he had last year, I think that would be the wake-up call that this can be taken away from you, right? Yeah. Quickly, and and it will be taken away from you quick enough. You, you know, whether you're Jalen Ferguson or Tony Saragusa, it all happens too quickly for all these guys. This is his chance to get paid to go out there and rip your knee up in week three against the the Patriots and making a million three a week. I, 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 it's just not good for him. Look, I have no care either way. Good for the Ravens to get away with this and keep $30 million of cap money on their side, as well as the actual money in the bank that they're uh, collecting interest on. But for Lamar to go out and play next Sunday, not good business for him. And, but if he has $150 million Lloyd's for London insurance policy, okay, I'll hear that because that's what he needs to have to play if he's my kid, if he's my client, if he's my friend, if he's my family member. That's what would, that would be a baseline. Okay, they're not going to give you 
the 180 you want right now. They're only offering you 110 million. You feel like that's not enough. Yeah, fine, but don't go play for 800 grand this weekend. Like literally, don't go. Oh, do he's that. he's making more than 800 grand because once, more... once, once. I mean, I, I hear you. I hear you. But but what? But everything you're saying applies to any player that's in that position. I mean, I don't think I don't. Not think every Lamar's... player's in his position. He's in a uniquely get the biggest contract in the history of the game kind of position. Not, yeah. Nobody's well, been in that position in a while. And, and he would say, Dangly well, in this way. and he would say, well, I wasn't in that position last year when everyone wanted me to sign last year. So maybe I'm doing this thing right. I, I mean, I'm just, just saying, I mean, he's, it, 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 whatever he, if they get something done in the next 10 days before week one, which I don't expect, but Hey, it could happen, right? I mean, it could come together. We've seen these deals come together very quickly uh, in the past with various well, whatever numbers out on but, the table is an enormous number. But my point, well, in excess of it is, yes. but it's it's and it's way more than he would have gotten a year ago had he signed. So from that standpoint, you know, I, I'm not going to fault him too much. At this, but at the same time, whether it's him, you know, in anyone, at some point you want to cash in your chips, right? I mean, you're sitting at the poker table or the blackjack table and you're on a heater and you're doing amazing and you've got all these chips, but at some point in time, until you cash out and you get what what's in front of you, they're, they're just pieces of plastic, right? I mean, that's, that's all it is. Uh, and you theoretically could lose it. So that is where you, you do look at this thing and say, you know, at some point in time, he's going to want to cash in, but he clearly isn't ready to do that. And the Ravens I would clearly also say at this point, if I'm his agent, I'm like, Let's start with this. You don't have a proven wide receiver. You have not a proven running back. You don't have a proven left tackle in there right now. We have issues on the defense. There's all sorts of issues with this team in yeah. thinking you're going to go out and win the Super Bowl this year to enhance your value. That's probably unlikely. Vegas would say that's unlikely, right? That, yeah. that they're going to win the Super Bowl this year. So if you're playing from that where Joe Flacco was as he comes uh, into focus next week, then that's a crazy way to play it. If you're playing it from the, I will have more value because I'm a quarterback and it's the NFL. And as long as I'm standing upright, which is where Joe was, because Joe wasn't top of class, right? You know what I mean? No. Nobody looked at Joe in the summer before he won the Super Bowl and said they should give him the highest contract in the league. Everybody thinks they should give Lamar the contract, except maybe me. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't really know that he's a five year quarterback the next five years or paying him for running around in 2019 and 20 which is all well and good but um this is a stalemate of a contract negotiation right and to your point Michael, we don't expect him to sign next week well if he's not going to sign next week then he is going out and taking on risk at some point real yeah risk, a lot of but risk. you know what though what you just laid out if i'm lamar i'd say well you just said that you're not very good at these other positions and we've won a lot of football games the last four years and I'm the mo I'm the biggest reason why. And and he would be right. So that's where I would say, I deserve all that money then. So, you know, what you just said as far as an argument for, you know, uh, him being defended, I would I would turn it around and say, that's why you guys need me, because without me, you're not a playoff team. And, and the Ravens aren't a playoff team without Lamar Jackson. I don't well, think they they're close to I'm with him this year. I mean, well, uh, you know, or but if they you know, they they've never done that. You know, they they all they've they were they were eight and four when he got hurt last year. And while well, they finished eight, nine then. So all of those reasons to me spells out why he should be wanting as much as he possibly can get. So, and again, you, you get to a point when how much is enough. And again, you, you want to cash in on your leverage, you know, leverage is just leverage until, you know, uh, until something changes. But uh, I mean, it's just, it's where it is. You know, it's fascinating, confusing, bizarre, weird, but <laughs> You know, it doesn't doesn't feel like this is the last time we're going to be talking about it. So uh, as we get to week one, it will cut off and it'll be you know, focused on football and reconvene, I guess, next February talking about the franchise tag, if that's how it plays out. But, you know, we will see what happens. These things can change, as I mentioned. Blink, and it'll be football season. Look out. Luke and I are getting ready for the uh, Jets next weekend. Luke will be in Owings Mills all week. Uh, I will be here and there and everywhere you are, including the Maryland Crab Cake Tour uh, out on the interweb. We are WNSD. AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore. Little Ravens, little Orioles, and uh, we never stop talking Baltimore positive.